the rapture and the deception in this study we're going to look into the doctrine and the teaching of the rapture sometimes called the great catching away this teaching of the rapture of the church is the biggest shared teaching in all of Christianity it crosses all lines of denomination and is taught in 90 percent of all the Christian churches some have written books and fictional stories about it others have made movies and still others have written gospel songs about it such as I'll fly away but what is the rapture is the rapture real is it an event that is biblical or is it a traditional and doctrinal teaching which is believed collectively due to a poor scholarly English only understanding of the Bible rather than what is actually written is the rapture the Bible's intended message concerning the return of our Lord and Savior or is it religious urban myth and traditional teaching that's what we will try to determine and prove in this study if you talk to most Christians today and ask about the rapture in other words if the rapture is biblical or not most without hesitation will say yes it's real and it's written in the Bible but how many know of the rapture simply because it is what they have been told all of their lives in other words how many have actually gone into the Bible and read all the scriptures concerning the return of Jesus Christ how many have studied in depth and gone back to the original languages of Hebrew Greek and Chaldean Aramaic to find out for certain for themselves what God's Word says about the return of Jesus Christ very few for most people are content to go to church for an hour or two a week if that and further to allow church or a denomination or their dear pastors or clergy to tell them what is correct or incorrect what is true or untrue about God's Word in doing so they open themselves up to deception because they haven't actually read for themselves and only a marginal amount of those who have searched in the Bible have read with understanding again mostly due to an English only understanding or putting complete faith in the translation that we have currently anyone who has done any in-depth study into the Bible will see that the Bible we have is mostly correct overall but it is a pale comparison to what is actually written in the original languages and texts and the less than total accuracy of the translation we currently use has caused many of the not denominational splits in the churches and usually over trivial little things which most of the time aren't even written but are perceptions brought about by traditional and or religious urban myth teachings which are so prevalent in the churches today the problem in churches today is an old problem which was even around in the time of Jesus Christ for the church and the so-called experts of the time of Jesus Christ had become so corrupt and misled till they didn't even recognize Jesus when he stood right in front of them they didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah instead they chose to deny him because of their ignorance of the truth and their lack of knowledge and non understanding of the message that the prophets of the Old Testament had written and the same kind of traditionalism and religious urban myths exist today as existed then and today many churches teach along purely denominational doctrinal lines they seldom encourage their congregations to look independently at the Bible and to check and see if what they are being taught is accurate or even correct because they are more interested in donning their priestly robes or looking also holy they are more interested in begging for money or browbeating their flocks into raising funds they're more interested with these things than they are with checking to make sure that they are accurately teaching God's Word as intended this is why it is never a good idea to put full dependence on your clergy to the point that you think that they can never be mistaken and as such never question or look for yourself but just blindly believe whatever they spoon feed you because they stand at the pulpit 
This rapture doctrine, also known as the any moment doctrine, which states that Jesus can return at any moment and take away the church, has become a stigma, an untouchable teaching in churches, even an unquestionable doctrine, meaning no one dares to question it for fear of being scoffed at or for fear of being told that they will be cast into hell if they don't accept it as the truth, the only truth. And that is cultish. But when did this rapture teaching take over and take such reins of power? When did it go from being a possible, a theory, to a written in stone, untouchable staple among the multitudes of Christianity? For myself, I was raised in what I thought was a Bible teaching church, with the teachings of hellfire and brimstone and Adam and Eve and the apple and the teaching of the rapture. And I was convinced. I didn't question the status quo of what I was taught. However, as the years went by and I sought broader teaching of the truth, in other words, I wanted to know everything about the Bible and to understand more than I had been taught, I began to see different things from the Bible than what I had been taught. I went into the Bible seeking the questions we all seek, such as who and what is God, why are we here and what is the purpose of life and what is God's plan and what are the things to come. Over the years as I attended different churches I was again and again taught one thing amongst all the churches, one doctrine that they all shared, the doctrine of the rapture of the church. And I believed it. I never once questioned it. Even though I had never really read it for myself, I did believe because it was what everyone else believed and said, and because the multitude of churches said so. It wasn't until later as I matured and began studying the Bible in greater detail that I found study of the Bible was uh, not so easy. I studied the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse from the original languages of Hebrew, Greek, Chaldee, and Syriac Aramaic. As I did so, I began to uncover things. I began to learn the structure and the patterns of those languages and to see that many of the words translated from those languages into English were bad choices for translation because they did not properly convey, uh, convey many of the actual true messages or thoughts as they were intended. I began to understand that many of the things that I had been taught were either not even written in the Bible at all or were very bad versions of what had been written. And some of them had taken a life of their own on in the churches. So that bad or incomplete translation became the message taught rather than the true message. And after a few generations no one seemed the wiser or to care. In other words, they uh, no one went back and looked at the original version or the original languages anymore, but instead taught the modern version without regard to the truth. And they misunderstood by virtue of how English is spoken, because English is a transitional language. And a transitional language, when spoken, does not reflect always accurately a locked pattern. In other words, Greek and Hebrew are fixed languages. They do not change or waver, whereas English changes generationally. But many choose to transliterate instead of fully translating verses or words. And that can and has caused many to believe or to get the wrong impression from certain things written in the Bible. It causes them to accept as fact things which are not even written in the Bible at all. To transliterate means to take a word from a language, even an ancient language such as Hebrew or Greek, and find the a uh, good enough match for it in English or whatever language you wish to translate it to. But some words in Hebrew and in Greek carry tremendous weight and value and cannot so easily be translated into English. Very often one word in Hebrew or Greek may be the equivalent of several words in English. So that when transliteration takes place there is a lot lost in the transfer. In other words, the full thought or message is not always accurately carried through. It's not carried forth. And it's either incomplete or taken out of its original context at times. So that one thing read in English reads differently than it read when it was in its original Greek. Oftentimes due to incompletion or of a thought or 
in completion of the full translation. And due to how it sounds when spoken in English, and you will see what I mean once we begin to cover some of these scriptures pertaining to the return of Christ, it can mislead. Let us also realize that there are many people who will take a single verse or a single chapter from the Bible and then build a entire belief around it. They'll build an entire religion, belief, or doctrine out of it. Many times they won't pay attention to the verses previous to the verse or the verses that come after or to the rest of the Bible even. And that's dangerous because the Bible must be understood as a whole. In other words, what the sum of the entire book says rather than what a certain verse here or a certain verse there says. And many do not realize how much power a taught doctrine or a taught tradition or belief can hold and wield over those who do not look for themselves. It can keep them from seeking any more than they have heard or been taught regardless if what they've been taught or what they have heard is correct or not. And again, many do not dare to question or rock the boat due, f due to fear. Either fear of the church or fear of being made to look the fool for asking such questions. And the rest are either too busy struggling with the day-to-day -day trials and tribulations of life or with the number of distractions that life affords us to get into their Father's Word and study what God has given us but rather they depend on those who claim to be knowledgeable in the word. And again, that's dangerous. Because you should never put blind faith in someone just because they claim that they're a pastor or preacher or priest or what have you. You never just assume that they can handle the word and see to it that you get taught correctly. You should never put full faith in any man on matters of such importance. Not me, not anyone. I do not ask anyone to believe as I believe. I only ask that you go and study the word for yourself and learn how to go in and trace the words back so that you aren't deceived. You would not allow someone who says they know how to do taxes to fill out your tax return without proof that they were doing it correctly, right? You wouldn't allow someone to work on your teeth unless you knew they were a good dentist, right? Then if you wouldn't allow that, why should you put your very soul in the hands of their ability to teach without going and looking for yourself. That isn't very smart. But many do just because in church it seems to be a whole different ball game, at least to some. Okay, with that said, let's go now and read some of the chapters and verses used to teach the rapture doctrine and see if they actually say that there will be a rapture or if they say that something else will occur. But let me caution you that subject and object, uh, an object are a must here. You must pay very close attention to subject and object or you won't understand. In doing this we will see what the uh, some of these verses actually say versus what they may sound like they say to an English only understanding. The whole point of this being to clarify and give greater understanding to those who seek the unabridged truth. Now, before we begin, as always, let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before your throne. We ask you to guide us and open our eyes and ears to give us understanding as we seek the truth of your word. We ask you to bless us with knowledge and wisdom and to uncover the real unabridged truth for us that we may understand your plan and understand your truth as it was set forth. And we ask these things, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so let's go and see if these verses actually point to a rapture, or if they mean something other than what, what is most commonly taught. You may easily verify if what I'm saying is true or not by following along with me in the Bible, and checking me out in the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, which is a Hebrew and Greek dictionary of the Bible utilized to uh, give the true words of the Bible and their definitions. Now, I plan to be precise here, and some of this lesson will take quite a while. So be patient with me, and follow along, and let's go discover the truth. 
Let's begin our search in the book of First Thessalonians. And we'll begin in First Thessalonians chapter 4. We will begin reading at verse 13. This is Paul's writing to the church at Thessalonica, or Thessalonica, whichever you prefer. And it will be Paul speaking. But in an effort to show you exactly how easy it is to misunderstand the subject and the object, and take things out of context, and uh, to misread the message as originally intended, I'm going to read these verses first in plain English with no explanation. Then I will reread the same set of verses again later with explanation and clarification from the original languages so that you can see just how deceptive and misleading this can sound to an English only perception or an English only understanding. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. And again, this will be Paul speaking. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent which them, them which are asleep. Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. <coughs> now, that sounds pretty compelling, does it? It sounds like we are going to fly right out of here and meet the Lord in the air in a rapture, doesn't it? But is that really what that set of verses really mean? Before we recover this, let's go get a clue from the same author, Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians. So turn, if you will, to the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, and we will begin with verse 1. And verse 1 reads, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, now, I'm going to go through this set of verses, and I am going to add to it with the Greek. I don't mean add to it. I'm not going to add anything that wasn't already there. But I'm going to clarify from the original languages. What Paul is saying here in that first verse is, Now we beseech you, brethren. In other words, I want to talk to you very seriously by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering back together unto him. In other words, I want to talk to you very seriously about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering back together unto him. Verse 2. That you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor word, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. In better words, Paul is saying, I don't want you to be confused or unsure or troubled. Because even in Paul's time, the people of Thessalonica, Thessalonica, were missing the actual message. This is one reason why Paul hurriedly wrote this second letter to the Thessalonians. Because he feared that they had taken his first letter, which we just read, to mean the wrong thing. Verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. Now I want you to pay very close attention to this word man. I will expound on that as we proceed. But remember, pay very close attention to the word man here. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except or until there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. There is a lot more in that one verse than you see written in the English. First of all, this falling away has a twofold meaning. First comes a falling away. The Greek word utilized here is apostasy. And the word apostasy in Greek means to give up or be 
fooled out of your chosen faith or religious beliefs. In other words, to give them up voluntarily or be deceived out of them. Now we see this happening a lot right now with the secular turn our nation is taking. But what this is really referring to is in the time when the man of sin, the son of perdition is revealed. Well, wait a minute. First of all, what does son of perdition mean? If you go to the Greek, it means the son who is to perish. The son who has been judged and is to perish. That only refers to one child, one son, one creation of God that has ju thus far been judged by God to be destroyed. It is none other than Satan himself. And since everyone, whether faithful or not, knows who Satan is, even atheists know who the character of Satan is. How can he be revealed? It means he is exposed. His lie or deception will be uncovered. Well, what lie? What deception? As we continue, you will see what lie, what deception. Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, what will he do? Exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he sits in the temple of God, showing or claiming to be God. Now, who is it who opposes God in this manner? Isaiah chapter 14 tells you exactly. It is Lucifer, Satan. Now, actually, he's going to claim to be Christ. Christ returned. This is the root of the word Antichrist. Most people take the word Antichrist to mean the opposite of Christ, just as they think of the word Antifreeze, which means it does the opposite of freezing. It won't freeze, or Antimatter, which would be the opposite of matter. But Antichrist from the Greek language means in place of Christ, or instead of Christ, or even in the stead of Christ. We use the same word today after the same fashion in words like homestead, meaning your home place, your dwelling, your place of abode. The problem is here that many have been duped by the modern idea and perceptions of what Antichrist is because of books they have read or movies they have watched, like The Omen or some of the uh, latter fictional uh, loosely Bible-based movies. Still others believe that he is a powerful, rich businessman who comes to power, or one of the many terrorist leaders in the world, or even others think he is a high-ranking politician, but this is incorrect. His name is Antichrist. It is not Anti-Bill or Anti-Tom or Anti-Bob. It means he stands in the place of Christ, stands in the holy place of Christ even. It also means he portrays himself as Christ, Christ's return. He stands in the temple of God, which is to say the church or even Mount Zion, Jerusalem, the place where, it, uh, where Christ said he would return. And also, he will be very religious. Deceptive, but religious. Part of his uh, method is to try to fool you into thinking he is Christ. So he will do exactly what you would expect of Christ. In the book of Daniel, it's written, he deceives by peace. He destroys wonderfully. Let's continue. Again, there is uh, only one who opposes God in this way that has thus far been judged to death, which is the death of the soul, even the second death. Verse 5. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? In other words, Paul had, had uh, discussed this with them at great lengths. Verse 6. And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Which is to say, the time when he rules, the time when he reigns, the time of his deception over man. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. This, of course, refers to Michael the archangel, who holds Satan in chains, and when Michael releases Satan and or casts him out to the earth, Satan will deceive many. 
Because contrary to popular belief, Satan is not an ugly creature with horns wearing a red suit and holding a pitchfork. As written in the book of Ezekiel 28, we are given his appearance. And his appearance is that of beauty and splendor. He was once a protecting cherubim of God. And very few know he is Satan. Or, excuse me, very few will know when he gets dropped down here that he is Satan. Especially when he drops down here with supernatural powers claiming to be Jesus Christ returned. Verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed. In other words, there's going to be a revelation. He's going to be exposed. And I want you to listen to what happens here now very closely. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Okay, there is your clarification. The Lord Jesus Christ shall consume Satan and Satan's deception as Antichrist with the spirit of his mouth. That sharp two-edged sword of the book of Revelation chapter 1, which means the truth. And by the brightness of the coming of the true Christ. Verse 9, he's going to expose, verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now you can go to Revelation 13 and you'll understand this better. But why are uh, his powers after the works of Satan? Because he is Satan. The Antichrist is just one of the offices or the roles that Satan plays, just as Satan in the Garden of Eden was the serpent and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Those are simply office, offices of deception. And not only that, the Bible is written notoriously in the third person. So it will help you to understand better if you realize these things. Verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because, here's your, here's your qualifier, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And there you have it. They didn't receive the love of the truth. They didn't care enough to study or to go into it and see the truth so that they wouldn't be deceived. Verse 11. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. What lie? that Satan is Jesus, that we are going to fly away? Verse 12, that all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And most of them do take pleasure in unrighteousness. Some speak so religiously for gain or for notoriety. They even put on fake healing shows or dance with snakes and drink poison to show their faith. And while they're doing this, they're not teaching the Word of God. Verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of our Lord, or of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Why would he say that? He's referring to the election here. If you don't understand the election, you really should, and you should understand predestiny. Remember when Jacob and Esau were still in their mother's womb, God said, Jacob I love, Esau I hated. There's a reason for that. I have various other studies on these subjects, such as Jacob and Esau then and now. Now let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and reread what we read earlier and see what the actual message that Paul was conveying was and is and this time we will clarify with the help of the original language of Greek. So chapter 4, verse 13 again. And it reads, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Okay, Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant about those who have passed on. Asleep here means passed on. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. This means the non-faithful, the atheist, the heathen, the unlearned, those who point the finger at you and say, redneck Bible thumper, or whatever. Many of them have no concept. Verse 14. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, in other words, which have passed on and have resurrected in Jesus, will God bring with him. If we believe that Christ rose from the dead, then those who have died also have risen, just as written in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Ere that silver cord part, and we go instantly back to the Father which gave us. And as in 1 Corinthians, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. You understand what Paul means when he says that? This is Paul's understanding of what he understood from the Bible almost 2,000 years ago. He's telling this to give you understanding. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Why? Because they are already with him. And we are in the flesh. Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay. What is the trump of God? What trump or trumpet is that? It is, of course, the seventh trump. And the dead in Christ rise first. Why? Because they have overcome. That's why it's written that they are in Christ. Now, who is it, what being is it, who comes to power or appears at the sixth trump, the sixth vial, and the sixth plague of the book of Revelation? It is, of course, none other than the Antichrist. Do you recall in the book of Revelation it says, Here is wisdom. Let him with understanding count the number, which is to say, keep track of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Six, three score, and six. Okay, the number of a man. Now I know that throws a lot of people right there. What's well, the number of a man it says right there? Yes, it does. A man even called the son of perdition. Just as a footnote for you so you can understand this, an archangel of God, which is named Gabriel, in other words, the archangel Gabriel, his name means man of God. So why is it so strange for people to fathom that Satan would be referred to as a man? This only means that he is male. It is referring to that man of sin, that son of perdition. Verse 17, to continue. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now this is where you're going to earn your pay. This is where we're going to separate the chaff from the wheat. If you go and check this word clouds out, you will see it does not exclusively mean the word clouds that we think of as clouds in the sky today, meaning steam and moisture rising and building like a cumulus cloud. No, this word in Greek for clouds is the same word utilized by the same author Paul in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 where it says, Paul speaking again, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Okay? The meaning of this word clouds means, in, from the Greek, a large group, a large group of witnesses even, which gather to Christ. It literally means all of us who dwelt in the flesh and all of those who Christ brings with them at his return. It is the same word that could be utilized if you, uh, maybe you've seen the movie A Swarm or The Birds. And the, in the movie The Swarm, there was a cloud of bees. Or in um, the movie The Birds, there was a cloud of birds. You can even think of it as a cloud of locusts. It simply means a massive number, a huge assembly or crowd. But people don't take it that way if they read it in English only. Now let's look to the next word, air, as in to meet the Lord in the air. This is the Greek word, A-R, or A-E-R. 
And it does not mean breath as in atmosphere. I mean, it does not mean the word air as in atmosphere. The word it means is breath, as in the breath of a living being, respiratory, or it means the spiritual life, for, life force which occupies our flesh body, even our very soul. It means the breath of life. You may recall when God created Adam, he breathed into his nostril, and the man became a living soul, meaning that the clay body or earthen vessel which God had made for Adam to dwell in became filled with his soul and came to life. The crux of this is when Jesus, or the true Jesus, returns, we will meet him in our spiritual bodies, meaning we will be through with the flesh. And as we know, Jesus is coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the King and His dominion. And flesh and blood cannot inherit nor enter the kingdom of heaven. And wherever Jesus Christ is as King and King, King of Kings and Lord of Lords is heaven. When Jesus comes in all His glory, we meet Him in our spiritual bodies. And you can verify that by going into the Greek. It simply means respiratory. Breathing as the living, breathing of a living being. We're going to meet him as a large crowd as we gather back to him. Verse 18. Where comfort one another with these words. Now we're going to go to some of the other places in our Father's Word to clarify the truth and see that what so many teach or is being taught by the churches today is incorrect and will lead people to worship the first supernatural being who sets foot on this earth and claims to be the Christ. Simply because they believe that Jesus can return at any moment to take his church. Now, this is not the way Jesus said he would return. Remember, Jesus said, Lo, I have foretold you all things. This means I told you ahead of time. Jesus told us exactly how he would return and what must happen first. But very few care to go and look for themselves. And because they don't, they receive not the love of the truth. So let's go to the other uh, books and verses and uh, see what they actually say. We know what they uh, sound like they say when read in English only because they sound like they imply that there's going to be a rapture. But in fact, if you check them out, you will say that you will see that they say exactly the opposite. Most of the time, those who teach these verses do not understand the context nor the subject of the object. Rather, they only teach within the narrow limits of what their church denomination allows them to teach. They're taught not to rock the boat. In the book of St. Matthew, chapter 24, there are a number of such verses which, again, when read in English only, and uh, taken as an English only perception and understanding, sound as though they are speaking of a rapture. Until you dig deeper and uh, uncover the truth. The entire chapter of Matthew 24 is speaking of what it will be like at the end of this earth age. Matthew 24 is one of the most popular chapters used by those to te who teach the rapture to teach it. This is why fearing to ask questions and lack of study causes people to be ensnared in the rapture trap. So, Matthew chapter 24, and we will begin with verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. This, of course, is Jesus Christ speaking. And then shall the end come, verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Now, that's uh, whenever Christ says something like that, you want to sharpen up. He's referring to Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 9. Who is desolation? Or to be more precise, who is the desolator? you'll find that this is yet another one of the names given to Satan. And what is his abomination? Well, we've been discussing it this whole time. He pretends to be the Christ returned. He causes the oblation to the true Christ, 
the sacrifice to the true Christ, the communion to the true Christ, to cease because people start worshiping him. Verse 16, Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Verse 17, Let him which is on the housetop not come down and take anything out of his house. Verse 18, Neither let him which is in the field return back for his clothes. Why? You won't need them. And why is this happening in Judea? Because it's happening in God's temple, Mount Zion. Verse 19, And woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Now, to better understand this, we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 4 when we get to Mark 13 and reread this in a second witness. When we go to the next chapter, or the place we will go in this study, which will be Mark 13, and read this same message again, then we will go to Isaiah chapter 54 to clarify what Christ meant when he said that. Verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not into winter, in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Why? Because when winter strikes, it's too late. Now most people will say, well, that means we missed the boat. We didn't rapture away. No. Do you recall the parable of the ten virgins who went to find oil? In other words, they waited till it was too late to start hunting the truth, and they weren't ready. They didn't have the oil in their lamps, the oil symbolic of the truth. Verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. Verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now we know that God has shortened the reign of the Antichrist to five months in the book of Revelation. But if he didn't, even the elect would possibly fall to him. Verse 23. Then, I want you to pay very close attention here. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. You know why? Because it isn't Jesus. It isn't the real Christ. It is the false Christ. Verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that it, if, if it were possible, they should deceive even the they shall deceive even the very elect, or deceive the very elect. Now, when it says false Christs here, this meaning is twofold. We have seen many false Christs since Christ was here or those who are worshipped as Christ, or even Messianic. Hitler was even thought to be some the Messiah. Charles Manson, David Koresh, and even Jim Jones of Guyana. But this also refers to those who come in the name of Christ, namely, those who profess to be Christians. Yes, brother, we're born again and we're going to fly away. This is who is being referred to here. It is twofold. Verse 25. Behold, I have told you before. Okay, this is Jesus telling you, I told you before. Not to go worshiping the false Christ. Not When they say it's him, don't go fall and worship him. Jesus warned us ahead of time and told us how he would return. Verse 26. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Why? The same reason. It won't be the real Jesus. It will be the false one, the Antichrist. If they tell you he's in the desert, don't go forth unto him. If they tell you he's in the secret chambers, which means in the secret, the holy of holies, on Mount Zion, don't go forth to him. Verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That means when the real Christ comes, everyone will know. But then again, when the false Christ comes, many will think they know. The majority will fall and worship him. Verse 28. For wheresoever the carcass is, 
there will the eagles be gathered together. And you're, you're going to find that this is not really eagles, it's buzzards. In other words, they gather to the stench. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation in those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give forth her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Verse 30. And then, do you understand this? And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. Now you can take that word there to be clouds in heaven if you like, because he will be coming from the clouds, but it's also a great multitude of witnesses, those he brings back with him. Verse 31, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, even the seventh trumpet at his arrival, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Verse 32, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, but putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Now, I'm not going to go into this study right now, but I have a lecture or study called the Parable of the Fig Tree. I advise you to listen to it or to find out about the fig tree. It simply refers to that which is hidden, the good and bad figs of the book of Jeremiah 35 and Jeremiah 24. It refers to when Israel is planted again and becomes a nation, which happened in the year of our Lord, 1948. So we would know the generation of the people that Christ would return in. It simply means that the people living in 1948 when Israel became a nation would not all die off before we see the return of the Son of God. Verse 33. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verse 34. Verily, or truly, I say unto you, this generation, which generation? The generation of the fig tree shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Verse 36. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not, he, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Verse 37. But as in the days of Noah were, so shall the son, coming of the Son of Man be. If you read Genesis chapter 6, you will see that there were fallen angels here cohabiting and giving and taking in marriage with human females. So it's going to be again when Satan and his army comes. His false angels claiming to be uh, real angels. Verse 38. For as it were in the days, as it, uh, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noe, which is Noah, entered into the ark. Verse 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the, son, uh, the coming of the Son of Man be. Now many people take that to cement the rapture theory. Well, he's going to come and take them all away and nobody's going to know it. It doesn't mean it in that context. It means the ones that are fallen and worshiping Antichrist will have no idea that they're worshiping the wrong Christ until it's too late. And Satan's flood of lies takes them away. Verse 40. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Verse 41. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Okay, here is another place that you have to be careful. This is another place that you're going to have to earn your keep in God's word. And make sure that you rightly divide the message being conveyed here. Now, I know most people say that I want to be the one that is taken. I sure don't want to be left behind because that movie said it's bad to be left behind. But you have to understand what the word taken here actually means. You have to understand that the word taken utilized here is a word of polarity, which means if you don't follow the subject and the object, you can take it the wrong way. Let me be clear. Suppose we take this word taken, 
which seems to some to be a positive, meaning they think they're going to be taken away by Christ in the rapture. But you need to look at the fact that this word was translated into 1611 Old Anglo-English. And in those times, they might have used a word uh, such as this, taken, in another sentence like this, such as, Sir, the castle's defenses have fallen, and the castle is taken. Or if you like, I will put this to a more modern connotation. A bank was robbed, and ten hostages were taken. Or, I went into a store for a moment, and I came out, and my car had been taken. Do you see the polarity of that word? Do you see how that word can change? So, if you don't understand the subject and the object, you're going to lose exactly what's going on here. You're going to lose the true message. Verse 42. Watch therefore, which means be on guard, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Now, in the next verse is the clarifier, so pay very close attention. Verse 43. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not have suffered his house to be broken up. Verse 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Why? Because the majority will believe that Jesus is already here. This is why Jesus said, I come as a thief in the night. It's not because of their, people are going to miss the boat for the rapture. It's because they're not going to be looking for another Christ. They're going to think he's already here, meaning they're going to think all has been fulfilled. When the Antichrist arrives claiming to be genius, uh, claiming to be Jesus, many won't be looking for another coming or for another second coming. Verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season. Meat is, of course, that which we partake of to keep us strong. This is an analogy that the Lord has appointed certain leaders over his children or over the household, which means appointed them to keep the affairs of the house, to keep the master's house in order. In short, to faithfully keep the word so that the house can stand strong to feed those within the house. Verse 46 Blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he doth cometh shall find doing so doing. Meaning, blessed is the servant who is found feeding the master's household while the master is away. In other words, keeping the household fed with the truth so that the household will not be deceived. The master's household, of course, being symbolic of the church. Verse 47. Verily, or truly, I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Verse 48. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, in other words, shall be deceived while waiting for Christ's return. Verse 49 and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink and be drunken. Verse 50. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he, in, in a day when he looketh for him, or when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of. And why would he not be ready on that day, or why would he not know the hour? Because he hasn't studied, he hasn't read. Verse 51. He shall cut him asunder, and appoint his portion appoint him his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth why will there be weeping and gnashing of teeth most people think well it's because of the pain of being in hell no it's because of the embarrassment because they have been numbered by hypocrites do you remember christ said not everyone who says lord lord shall enter into the kingdom for christ shall say to some of them Get out of my sight. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that do iniquity. Their portion is with the hypocrites. In other words, 
those who play acted. Hypocrite in Greek means play actor. Now we're going to end up right here for this particular study. And we'll come back to this and pick up where we left off in the next. Because we're running out of time here. But it is my prayer for you that you will study your Father's Word diligently. That you will get into the study of your Father's Word. That you will dig deep. And that you will find the buried treasure that is our Father's Word. Because many have no idea what's coming. They have no idea of the deception. And they have no idea that they're being lied to or at the very least misled by those who don't know actually what they're teaching. However, I hope you are not numbered with them, nor numbered with the hypocrites. I hope you do diligently seek your Father's counsel and His face, and ask Him to come unto you and reveal His truth to you. Thank you for listening to part one of this study. This has been Just Thoughts.